Boxing Podcast. Year is coming to a close. We got you two UFC cards left, but a killer pay-per-view this Saturday going down to the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. It's UFC 282, and we've got the vacant light heavyweight strap up for grabs here between former champion Blockowitz and the longtime division dark horse here in Magomed Ankalaev and promoted to co-main. Patty the Batty taking on Jared Gordon. Uh, should be a very, very good fight. We have had a couple fighters pull out, lose a couple fights, but we are still at 13 on the books for Saturday. As always, we'll break down that co, uh, co-main and main event, find some fighters and prop bets that we really like, think are going to come through here. Make sure to like the video and sub to the channel if you guys haven't. Help us out a ton. Last week was an incredible fight night. UFC Orlando crowds always bring those finishes. Uh, mixed bag of results for us. It was an incredible night at the office for yourself and, you know, uh, the main event, Kevin Holland, substantially changed my night from potentially a, a positive, you know, going positive in the first round KO to having a minus night because he quits on the stool, you know. Uh, got me back in the cap this week, but looking to turn it around headed into this pay-per-view. Yeah, man. So we'll, we'll take a look at your card first. You got in early on Sergey Pavlovich's money line at minus 160. You also got in early at the under one and a half. Um, those were two of your bigger bets of the night and probably the cleanest plays of the year. Um, Sergey Pavlovich definitely made that look easy. It was the uh, Natan Levy and Gennaro Valdez under two and a half that I think got you as well as the majority of right. the of the people out there. Um, plenty of opportunities for that fight to finish. It just didn't end up happening. Um, manageable loss at only minus 2.3 units, something that you can easily come back from. And then taking a look over at my card, uh, I think my favorite bet of the card was the the first fight of the night with Estela Nunez, Yasmin Jaruji under two and a half rounds. Um, both those girls made a case for that yeah, under right did. there. Um, I hit that at plus 180. And then the uh, Nicolau wins by TKO at plus 280. <laughs> if you're shaving your head to make weight, you're bound to get knocked out. Um, I ended up the night plus 7.65 units and looking to keep the ball rolling. Not originally the scheduled main event, but certainly a fit replacement between Magomed Ankiyev and Jan Blakovitz. Magomed coming into this matchup on an eight-fight win streak and one of the many dominant fighters under Katarov's payroll. <laughs> and uh, Jan being the former light heavyweight champion, the fighting pride of Pol- Poland, um, and looking to regain his title here. If I'm being completely honest, I do not think it's going to be a good night for Yan, man. Um, I look at the different areas of MMA each of these guys have advantages in, and I feel like I edge every single one of them towards the side of Anki Elayev. In the striking, I feel like Ank is much more patient and measured in his approach to closing distance, and he wastes zero energy with his shots because he knows that he's big enough that if any of them land, he's subject to put anybody on their ass. Uh, Yan has kind of coined the term Blocko Blitz <laughs> since he's entered the UFC, and it's a reckless way of him closing the distance from the outside. And although we haven't seen that Blocko Blitz in a while, I think that Ank has the style that's frustrating enough with his movement to bait Yan into rushing in and exposing himself. When it comes to wrestling, I think it's far more likely that we see Anki Elayev shooting for the takedown just to kind of keep Yan guessing. Uh, you know, it's something many fighters in the past have had success with Yan or against Jan with. Cardio doesn't seem like much of a problem for either men. I, I doubt it plays much more of a factor unless there's a whole lot more grappling that comes into play that I'm not anticipating. I think my biggest worry here is Ankulaya of dropping a close decision. Um, as we saw in the Vulcan and the Tiago Santos fight, he's known for making rounds closer than they need to be and then losing moments simply because of lack of volume or, or sense of urgency. Outside of that, I really do think he's got that edge everywhere, being the younger, bigger, faster, more technical fighter inside the octagon. And uh, I hope that it's uh, an easy win for him. I think the price tag is is reasonably put out there. Man, I, I really would have to agree with you on a whole lot of stuff. And, you know, I knew we were going to potentially need a ton of help after Yuri and, and Glover get scheduled a second time. But I just thought I would tell everybody, you are welcome if you're holding that plus 1,000 future ticket in your hands because that looks so much better than what's trending to be minus 300 here come fight night. Um, but with Jan, even at 39 years old, man, the Polish power, it's real. It's fight-changing power. You know, he can he can uh, change the fight in a split second, and you always got to give the guy props. Uh, starts off 2-4 and four in his UFC career, has now proceeded to win 10 of his last 12 fights. Um, he holds that championship experience, the, the high-paced five-round experience. And one thing Jan does really good is he's got a really good kicking game. He knows kind of how to win points, you know, whether it's on the outside beating up the lead leg or like the Reyes fight ending all his combinations with that body kick. Um, and he's got sneaky ways in tight to, you know, to land his left hand. 
But I do think he's at a significant striking disadvantage to go with a significant speed disadvantage with the hands as well. Um, you know, and then watch Blockowitz's fights with Glover Teixeira, his first fight with Corey Anderson, the second round of Alexander Rakic prior, to, you know, to the knee injury. If you take John Blockowitz down, the guy doesn't really have much off of his back, and he doesn't really have much of a get-up game either. And so, like you said, man, I think there's clear paths to victory is pretty much everywhere for Magomed here, and I think the betting line is pretty correct. Uh, the division's dark horse, pretty much what everybody's called this guy for the last couple of years, and minus the little laps and fight IQ with one second, you know, it's kind of been set back about two years by Paul Craig, but this guy probably would have been fighting for a title a long time ago, and I kind of... When I talk about him, it's almost kind of like Israel a little bit. You know, if, if you plan on just striking with this guy at range, like, good luck. You know, he's he's very patient. He doesn't he doesn't rush himself. He doesn't take risk. Uh, and, he, you know, you're, you're going to have to put yourself in danger if you're going to want to hit him. And I think if Blockowitz does that, he's probably going to find himself like the Tiago Santos fight, rushing in, Ank stepping off, landing a hook, and putting him down. And, again, go back to the wrestling. I think I favor Ank there, who's – 30 years old. I just think it's his time right now, you know. Um, he's a decade, decade younger almost than Jan, and I think Magomed Ankalaev come Saturday is our new light heavyweight champion. In our co-main event spot, we got Patty Pimblett taking on Jared Gordon. Fight moved up to the co-main event here. Patty's becoming instantly one of the UFC's biggest stars to date, um, and in a very big spot here on the last pay-per-view of the year. It's in Vegas in front of a sold-out crowd, not at the apex. Um, you know, I think this is the you know, the U.S. breakout moment for Patty Pimblett if he performs well here. Uh, former Cage Warriors champion, you know, and I really like the fact that he, you know, he got offered the UFC a long time ago, but didn't rush to move over here. Knew he was young, knew he needed that experience. And you can really tell it in his physique and his maturity and everything. He looks um, like a well, a much more uh, well in fighter than he used to. And, it, man, the UFC run is starting off perfect for him. And while I'll say I think there is going to be a time to fade Patty Pimblett, I don't think this is the time, man. I think the guy has a good ground game. He's dangerous uh, with the submissions. You know, his defensive wrestling is what's going to cost him as he goes up the ranks. I like his, like, submission threat off bottom. I like his ability to get up. But the takedown defense does need some work. Um, and the striking on the feet, um, still improving. But I think the guy's got the much more powerful shots. He can 100% eat the better shots with the better chin. Um, and I think, although they both used to be featherweights, Patty should l definitely look like he's a much bigger, longer guys here. And, I do think he's going to touch Jared Gordon's chin over some time. If if Jared's going to have success, it's going to have to be, I think, with the grappling, with the wrestling, looking to try to get top control. He's an underrated black belt, and I, that is the one worry, is that he gets Patty down and rides out control, kind of makes this boring. But at the same time, it almost reminds me of, like, Zuma Gulov's last two. You take him down, you don't do anything, man. Judges are not rewarding that kind of style with no damage from top control. And if you think that you were gonna, you know, you're gonna lose every minute on the feet, and then have a top control. If they're gonna give you the decision over Patty Pimblett, you're sadly mistaken, man. You know, if this fight's close, I, I think I know who it's going to. Um, the biggest concern is Jared. Four times he's lost by TKO. One time he's been submitted. He's he's been finishing all five of his losses. Um, I do think Patty Pimblett puts him away, and kind of like the aura of Conor McGregor. You got a big mental hurdle before you even step in the cage. You know, when that whole crowd shouting Patty's name and you're standing there in the octagon, man, that's a big moment you got to get over. Something I think is going to be a little bit too much for Jared Gordon. I think the pressure is going to be weighing on him. You got Patty by TKO, man. Okay, so I'll, I'll start off by saying I do not agree with the opener at Patty plus 125. <laughs> I love that. Uh, but I do think it's a whole lot closer than to the true odds than the current price tag. Patty is sitting at minus 260. You know, I, I do try and take a step back, look at this fight objectively from a marketing perspective. And yeah, this is obviously a setup fight for to allow Patty to carry on with being a UFC superstar. But the truth of the matter is there's limited good matchups at 155 pounds in the UFC, man. And don't get me wrong. I, I don't believe Jared Gordon is going to be the new face of the UFC going to become champion by any means. But I'm pretty confident in saying Patty will never touch UFC gold himself. He's one of my favorite fighters to watch in the last few years by a long shot brings the casual eyes to the screen, gives the UFC the much-needed star. But his reckless style that he fights with is perfectly set up for any jobber in the UFC mm -hmm. roster to catch him clean and give him one of those meme losses. Patty's intensity and that aura around his fights, it's a ton of weight that his opponent takes on, like you mentioned. Um, but Jared has kind of built his brand on mental fortitude by turning his life around from drug addiction, and I think that that could actually work to his advantage if he handles it the right way. 
Um, I look at the list of opponents that Jared's lost to on the UFC roster, and outside of maybe Joaquin Silva, I really struggle to find anybody that I think Patty wouldn't have had the same outcome against. You look at Grant Dawson, Charles Oliveira, a 2018 Diego Ferreira, nobody that I'd be hanging my head to uh, with a loss. And then Joaquin Silva, that dude carries a punch. He's not that great, but he does he does have some finishing upside. Um, what I'd like to see happen uh, versus what I think will happen differ dramatically. What I'd like to see happen um, is Patty go out there, capitalize on the moment with a quick submission win. But in reality, I think we're going to see a fight where Jared tries to use his strength and wrestling to make the fight dirty by pushing Patty up against the fence, winning on control time where Patty is going to be forced to defend takedowns over and over again and will score some strikes in between, giving him a very close decision win. So ultimately, I am going to go with Patty. Um, but I do think that Jared's going to make this a, a tougher fight than what these odds are telling you. This was a tough choice for my fight of the night, but I ended up going with Chris Curtis taking on Joaquin Buckley. I think that this is going to be an absolute banger from the rip, man. Uh, great matchup for both guys, oddly enough. In my eyes, it's a huge opportunity for Buckley, who's coming off of a loss. And then for Chris Curtis, he's getting a significant step down in competition from Jack Hermanson. Plus, both these guys have struggled being too small in the middleweight division, and we finally have a matchup where neither guy's going to be at physical disadvantages. I would lean towards the majority of this fight taking place on the feet, although if somebody is going to initiate the grappling, I do think it's going to be Buckley. Curtis hasn't even shot for a single takedown in the five fights he has had in the UFC, including that contender series bout, where we saw utilize where we saw Buckley utilize his takedowns in the Abdul Razak Al Hassan fight. He did a great job of timing those double legs underneath the aggressive shots coming from Al Hassan. And, you know, that being said, that was his first time where his cardio took a significant hit. And by the end of the fight, we saw Al Hassan winning the grappling exchanges and actually on top of Buckley in the third round, <laughs> which is you never hear that about Al Hassan. Um, if this does stay on the feet, I do think we're in for some fireworks. As we saw in that first round of, the Cur of Curtis's debut against Phil Hawes, Curtis has an excellent defense and does a great job of eating damage while looking for holes to expose in his opponents. Um, he does a great job of keeping a high guard and, and has a good chin to match it as well. Buckley, he throws everything into his shots and is constantly throwing his entire body weight into punches. And they make for devastating shots when they land, but they can definitely eat at the gas tank and allow for openings because of how wide his shots are coming from. I think it's likely that we see Chris Curtis take an initial onslaught from Numansa early, um, but if he survives the early pressure, I think that he will start to make his way back into the fight, and I'm actually kind of leaning the dog here in Curtis. What do you think? Uh, yeah, man. Super, super good fight. One that I, I do think plays out extremely close, and you know, really, it's kind of hard to get in, I think, a super comfortable read here. Like you said, I mentioned, you know, Curtis seems to really, really like it here at 185, despite being undersized. You know, he can fight more frequently, not cutting a ton of weight. Um, and body seems to perform a whole lot better as well. You know, he's 3-1 and one in the UFC, and the one loss that he has, it wasn't really ideal circumstances to get your first top 10 opponent. It's on short notice. You have to fly over to London. You know, you're thrown into a co-main event spot. and kind of just couldn't find Jack and couldn't get the range down, and I don't really see him having that problem here. I think he's actually going to be one with the better footwork, the better technical striking in combination, and like you said, keeps that tight shell, almost like a Floyd Mayweather shoulder up. He's hard to hit and durable when he does. Um, I like the way he works the body, man. He will dig the left hand of the body, drop your hands, and that'll let you know allow for that power up top. Um, Buckley, you know, yeah, younger, more fat. He's faster, probably more a little bit more athletic, but I don't see the same skill set. You know, he's more of that one and done, one strike at a time, loads up and telegraphs a whole lot of his shots. Um, and yeah, he is the one probably with the wrestling, but I agree, it's probably gonna eat at the gas tank and. Watch Chris Curtis versus Rodolfo Vieira. Stuff all those takedowns, stay on the outside. I'd, I'd be shocked if Buckley really found success with it. Um, fun fight, man. I think it probably goes over the 1.5. I was looking at that on Bet Online, and they took it away. It definitely would have been a sweat with what Buckley's going to be um, slinging around one, but I think Curtis' is striking is just a whole lot more technical. He throws a whole lot more, and that volume's going to win him on the um, down on the stretch. Maybe a late-round finish. I, I think it's dog or pass here as well, man. Chris Curtis is going to be the pick, and... Might have to hop in on it if I see us both on the underdog, man. For my fight of the night, I went with no other than Bryce Thug Nasty Mitchell taking on Ilya Taporia. Best fight on the card, man. Best fight left this year for me. I cannot even begin to tell you how pumped I am for this one. People's main event, you know, you got a 15-0 Bryce Mitchell, a 12-0 Ilya Taporia. Somebody's O's got to go here on Saturday. 
you know, Bryce Mitchell finished third on the Ultimate Fighter, but oddly enough, his career's had more success than any of the guys coming off that show and looks sensational so far. Uh, Twister submission in round one against Matt Sales, and then the just dominating performances over Andre Feely and Edson Barbosa. Call him the hillbilly Khabib, you know. Uh, the guy sticks to the game plan. He changed the takedown attempts together. When he gets you down, he's got good top control. He's got a good, excellent jiu-jitsu game, and a good gas tank to back it up. Um, the striking, still a work in progress. I told you he's got a nice little sidekick to him. And, you know, I don't want to say the hands look good, but when you're, you know, when you got so much of a takedown threat, it does open your hands up top. And you saw that when he said Edson DeBarboza down with that straight left hand. Um, but, man, I, I would be lying if I said he had an easy fight in front of him on Saturday. I, it's easily his toughest fight to date, in my opinion. I think Taporia is an absolute motherfucker. Um, unreal power in his hands. The knockouts of Damon Jackson and Jai Herbert are some of the filthiest knockouts that I've I've ever seen, man. And then showing me heart and the ability to recover from eating that head kick from Jai Herbert, that's something else that you like to see. His striking is on another level, especially compared to Bryce Mitchell. The way the guy digs to the body to drop your hands. Bryce spends any time striking with this guy. I could see it being over pretty quick. Um, but, you know, if Bryce doesn't deviate from the game plan, he might find some success. We have Taporia. You can say what he want about where he is on weight right now. We've seen him pull out of a fight at 45 before because of it. We've seen him already have to fight at 55 one time. The weight cut for that man, it is a little bit more difficult for than other 45ers. And if Bryce is willing to put on a high-paced wrestling performance, I'll give the guy a pass, short notice, debut with Zalal. But I think Bryce is on a much better level than Zalal with his scrambles and wrestling game as well. I think that kind of game could make this close down the stretch. I think the third round goes to Bryce Mitchell at a decently high clip in this fight. Um, my heart does want Bryce Mitchell to win, but the smartest thing for me here um, is going to be is going to be to pass. Uh, you know, I, I want to I'm going to pick Bryce Mitchell, but who do I think can make this fight look the easiest? Who do I think has that finishing upside? It is Ilya Kaporia. Yeah, man. I, I don't think that this sees the third round, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty heavy on Ilya Taporia here. Um, I'm not convinced that Bryce is going to be able to initiate the grappling. Anytime that Ilya has found himself on the ground, it's him that's initiating the grappling. And I do think that he's strong enough and just well-versed enough, both in grappling and in stand-up, that he's not going to overextend. He can get, He's strong enough to get up if he is taken down and then the power i think that that's going to be the biggest tale tell of this fight is if it stays on the feet i think bryce is going to run out of options to throw offensively and Ilya is not going to stop moving forward i don't see a world where bryce is going to score a knockout win and Ilya got hit with a baseball bat in that Jai Herbert fight, and it did not stop that forward pressure at all. So Bryce is going to have to come up with some type of strategy to stop the forward pressure of Ilya. And if he can't get that fight to the ground, then I think it's going to be a really long night for him. Short, um, for him. short uh, <laughs> sorry, a really short night for him. And uh, yeah, so I've got Ilya all day here. For my fighter to watch... I have Raul Rosas Jr. I mean, how could this guy not be your fighter to watch on this card? He's the youngest ever UFC signee in history, needing his parents to approve him for his last fight on the Contender Series at 17 years old. And now he's coming in as a full-blown adult, 18 years old, and what I believe is going to be his toughest test to date against Jay Perrin. Um, when I look down his record, I am less than impressed, man. I mean, over the, the seven fights that he's had, including his amateur bouts, his opponent's combined record is 3-3. Three and three. And, um, you know, before getting his call up to, to the Contender Series, I think that there's a lot of skeptics out there that aren't too high on a teenager getting the call up to the UFC so early. And although Jay Perrin isn't exactly a great representation of UFC talent, it's extremely important for Roses to capitalize on this opportunity and prove to the world that he has what it takes to hang with the big dogs here. I think that this fight's going to be really good and one that you have to, to watch out for. And uh, all, of the, all of the pressure is on Roses here. I think we both like the under in that fight a whole mm -hmm. lot. I think there's finishing upside both ways. Uh my fighter to watch happened to be another under that we he like. I'm going to go with Edmund uh, Shabazian for my fighter to watch. Was once that undefeated prospect, you know, that looked like he was headed straight for the belt. Now finds himself on the L3, you know. He did finally lo uh, lose, uh, leave the longtime coach, Edmund Taverdian, whatever his name is. Now he's doing uh, camp at Vegas, Extreme Couture. He's only 25 years old, man. There's 
still plenty of time for you know Edmund Shabazi to improve. He's a dangerous kickboxer. I think he's got a clear path to victory to beat Dalcha if this fight stays on the feet. He's a phenomenal kickboxer, nasty clinch, good jab. The way he had hides his head kick behind you know his hands and uh, the uh, Tavares knockout is mm-hmm. beautiful. But the wheels fall off pretty damn quick when things aren't going his way. You know, he struggles with the wrestling, doesn't have a lot of takedown defense, can't get back to his feet, and the cardio seemed to take a pretty big dip as well. And I saw some quit in the boy too, you know. And so good luck if you lay minus 300 on him to win here. I personally won't be doing that. Um, You can't really trust him at that price uh, going forward. But it is a big step down in competition compared to the Brunsons, the Hermansons and things. But, um, you know, I'm excited to see if he can get back on track here, man. My fighter to watch. For my underdog, I am taking Darren Till. Let's oh, yeah, I'm a little worried, man. He didn't look good his last time out. And full disclosure, I've never been too high on Drickus Duplessis. Right. Um, something about his unorthodox striking methods, along with his body language inside the octagon, it's always made me uneasy backing Duplessis as, as a fighter. I think that this is a perfect opportunity for Darren Till to get back on track with the UFC, man. Uh, Duplessis has a good enough record in the UFC that a win over him gets Till back into fights with top 10 guys, um, where Duplessis has shown multiple times in his striking that, although dangerous, he lacks a lot of technical aspects, man. Um, He's been fortunate enough to get matched up with guys like the Pillow King, Marcus Perez, or (laughs) Officer Giles, um, even (laughs) Brad Tavares, who all lack the stand-up game to explode, expose Duplessis' shortcomings. Duplessis, he shows a switch stance in his fight, but the over, over fights, but the overwhelming majority of the time his output comes from the orthodox stance. Till, his guy will have that left high kick open all day being in the southpaw stance. That being said, I do think that the kill shot's going to come from the signature left straight. Duplessis has a problem with just shelling up during his opponent's attacks, and I think that Darren's piston of a left hand is going to shoot its way through his guard and find his chin one, uh, sooner rather than later. So I've got Darren Till as my underdog. I got a unit on Darren Till as well, man. Uh, Officer Giles got me. <laughs> <laughs> underdog for me, I mean, damn, I'm going to go with Eric Silva, the guy that I was prepping to bet at the minus 160 range. I'm now getting minus 105 potential of plus money by fight time and you know on the surface when you look at tj i kind of do get it you see a 35 year old eric silva making his ufc debut kind of a weak level of competition um i kind of get on the surface while the tj money's come in but you know i think the problems that tj struggles with are really the the areas that eric silva strives in and can really take advantage of and when you look at all of tj uh tj brown's fights all of them are going to hit the mat at some point, you know, and TJ, to me, doesn't really have anything off his back. He he already has a 41% takedown defense himself. He's out here getting out-wrestled by Danny Chavez, for Christ's sake, the, the dude that I didn't even know could wrestle, the Mexican warrior, you know. Um, you know, getting uh, Norton Becke reversing him, um, you know, getting submitted by Jordan Griffin by leaving your neck out. You know, TJ could be the better tarp like top position wrestler but he is not very sharp in getting there he shoots his takedown attempts very sloppy leaves his neck out chaining them together and i see a first round guillotine coming for eric silva very easy just got gut feeling you know and you you want to go after it i I think eric silva plus 850 round one sub is a very clear path to victory here um and i don't you know i'm kind of glad i don't have to lay the chalk on the 35 year old debuting fighter at minus 160 now to get him as an underdog where he's got clear path to victory is a clear finishing upside i think he gets around one sub cash my underdog play this week for my prop of the night a little bit of a long shot for sure uh it is steven coleslaw <laughs> Is what I've been calling him. Obi Wan Shinobi the Pillow, Stephen Coslow, who is six and zero, all six of his wins by first round submission. He's up against another undefeated fighter in Cameron Saman, who is also six and zero, but only twenty one years old. Man, I think on principle, having six first round submission wins and then getting his first round submission at plus sixteen hundred, you have to play Stephen Col- Coslow. Co slow here. Um, it, it's just, uh, it, it seems like a no brainer bet to me. Plus 1600, I'll take that any day. I don't know too much about him. I know that the tape out there has been a little uh, shifty, but I have heard that <laughs> the other guy struggles early with grapplers. And I think that, I think that this is a perfect opportunity for Stephen Co to 
make a huge impact in his UFC debut and wrap up an early first round submission. Taking it on short notice and everything, yeah. I do think that he's going to go all out right. and uh, go for his his number one win condition. And it's less than six percent is what they got that at. Yeah, you know, it, it's a must stab. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, Till versus Duplessis doesn't go the distance. You can get that at minus one seventy on uh, Bet Online. I think both guys are are coming for a finish. You've got Darren Till who really you know needs to put himself out on the map. You know, you, you got a you got a middleweight who's a severe step down in competition. If you want to put yourself back in contention, you need a finish and. I'm telling you, Duplessis is coming out here to put his name on the map to get that finish over the, you know, a, a, a high name in the sport that people know, and and then you know, so I think both of them have that finishing upside. And Duplessis, you know, until his last fight, you you eliminate the Brad Tavares fight, and people would lay minus 170 all day that his fights don't go the distance. But even watching the Tavares fight, my goodness, there's finishing moments for both those guys the whole time. He catches like a second wind after gassing out, and Tavares is a decision magnet. Exactly, you're right, you're right. And then Till's been finished in his last three fights. Man, he seems to maybe not have it anymore, have a little bit of quit in him. So I think that both guys have a finishing upside here, and hopefully Darren Till's the one to get that done for us. No surprise, best bet. I think this goes. This applies to both of us. It's Magomed and Kilaev. Um, we touched on it at the beginning of the podcast, but I do think that he's got the advantage everywhere, whether it stays striking, it goes to the ground, um, or if it's an extended 25-minute fight. I do think that Magomed, um, he doesn't waste any energy when he throws. He's super efficient. I think he's, his cardio is going to hold up, and uh, I think that he's a he's – a surefire win. I know that that's almost jinxing it, but yeah, I do. Yeah. I do think that he's a a quality pick, a good anchor piece. Um, he should get it done, just as the bigger, faster, better fighter on Saturday. I'm with you. I'm three units deep on Michael Med as well, man. Uh, I'm gonna take Patty the Pimblet for my best bet in the co-main event here. You know, I struggle to see how really decisively Jared could win the fight. I think his only hope is to get Patty down to kind of gain that top control ride it out on the judges scorecards and hope it's rewarded which you know when you lose all the minutes on the feet is really not guaranteed and it's also not a guarantee when you're fighting UFC's darling here and Patty the Batty either you know um, I think he can competitively grapple with Jared I think if he finds himself on bottom it's not going to be for a long time I like to get up game and I think that's going to zap Jared's cardio from repeatedly trying to you know take him down and Patty working his way back up um, and then once it's on the feet I think that's where Patty does get the finish much more power on his shots I've seen him eat clean left hooks from Vandermini, and Jared just does not have that same durability at this point in his career. I get it on Patty at minus 190, minus 196. It's north of like minus 250 now. I think Patty goes out there and shines in this co-main event. I think they've got him here for a reason. I think he puts Jared away in probably rounds two or three, add to them knockout losses. Patty for the best bet this week. We start off our quick pick section of the podcast in the Bantamweight division where we see Cameron Saman taking on Stephen Koslo, both 6-0 and undefeated. We've got a prop bet on Koslo's first round submission. Uh, I'm going to go with him I think as our first dog of the car. Yeah, and I think that's the clearest path to victory for either one of these guys. That's what they've shown me they can do enough, so I'll tag along. Koslo. Koslo. Moving up, uh, 125s. Uh, Daniel Da Silva taking on Vinicius Salvador. I'm going to go Vinicius Salvador. I wish I could have got under two and a half at this price tag, but it seems like the bookies have caught on, moving it to under one and a half. Da Silva's pretty much killed or be killed, and I think he goes down Salvador inside the distance. Yeah, I, I think I'm with you. I'm leaning Salvador here. Uh, moving up, we go to the featherweight division, Eric Silva versus TJ Brown. Um, I think... We're both on Eric Silva here. We are both on Eric Silva, and I'd love for that first round submission to hit. Um, yeah, men's featherweight, getting to the real meat of the card here. Billy Q taking on Alexander Hernandez. I've got a bet on Billy Q at minus 160. Um, Hernandez, I have said he should make featherweight for a long time, but when you show cardio issues already, now you add a 10-pound weight cut, and you're fighting a cardio freak in Billy Q. Um, I like that. I like the minus 160 on him. Yeah, I'm going to go with Billy Q as well. He's shown he's durable enough to yeah. take the uh, the early onslaught, and I think he'll be able to outlast and capitalize on him late in the rounds. Uh, moving up to the middleweight division, Chris Curtis taking on Joaquin Buckley. Another dog for me. I'm going Chris Curtis here. Haven't tracked anything yet, but might get there before the week's up, man. I'm going to go Chris Curtis as well. Moving on, middleweight division, staying in the middleweight division, Edmund Shabazian taking on Daucha Lujian Bula. 
Uh, don't parlay Edmund, I'll tell you that. But um, I think he's going to get it done inside the distance and get back on track. Yeah, I texted you earlier in the week. How many times can Edmund shit the bed and you know continue to get minus 250 price tags on him? I do think it's going to be a whole lot closer than the odds are saying, but I, I do have Edmund as well. I think that he uh, definitely has early finishing upside and could, could get the job done, make it look relatively easy, and will present an awesome fade in the future. Yes, sir. Um, moving on, we go up to the heavyweight division. Jorenzo Rosenstruik versus Chris Dawkins. I think Dawkins is going to be really timid to get hit in this fight. Um, that might work out for Rosenstruik, who's usually low volume. I'll go uh, the kickboxer, Jorenzo, here. I'm going to go Rosenstruik. I, I told you all week when he KOs Dawkins, it's just going to look like the easiest bet in the world. It just can't do it, man. Rosenstruik's going to be the pick, though. Jay Perrin taking on Raul Rosas Jr. I think Jay Perrin is going to try to give the young man a fight, but I, I don't think he's as versed on the ground as he needs to be. I think the 18-year-old is going to come out here and sub Jay Perrin. Yeah, what's Perrin got to lose? I think that he should go out there and give it his all, but I, I do agree. I think that Rosas Jr. is going to show that uh, even though he's young, he can hang with these big dogs. I'll give him the win as well. Moving on. Our most uh, anticipated matchup of the card, Bryce Mitchell versus Ilya Taporia. Um, I'm pretty heavy on Ilya Taporia. I do think that he'll be the one to maintain that undefeated record. This is a real tough one for me, you know. My uh, my gut does tell me Ilya Taporia is going to win, and that's usually the way that you, you need to side. But my heart is going to side with Bryce Mitchell to cook him to the bone on Saturday. Moving on, Darren Till taking on Drekis to Plessis. Um, man, 174 was what, plus 174 is what we got Darren Till at when it spiked. I take that money line bet on him all day. Um, Darren Till to get back on track. Yeah, Darren Till, I got two units on him. I, uh, I We need him to win. We yeah. need him to win. <laughs> um, moving on, we stay. Is this a catchweight bout at Looks 180? Like Looks like it. So Santiago Ponzinibbio finding a last minute replacement in Alex Morono. Prelims. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Bring bring the heavyweight Rosenstruck right. Dawkins fight up. Yeah. But um Ponzinibbio Morono, I think I'm gonna side with the uh, the old man here in Ponzinibbio. Yeah, definitely Morono taking this on short notice a couple days. You you gotta side with Ponzinibbio here. Um Patty Pimblett taking on Jared Gordon in our co main event. Patty Pimblett, round two TKO. I don't know. I've been wanting to say Jared Gordon all, all <laughs> podcast, but I think I'm going to go with you on Patty Pimblett. I think he, this is set up for him to win, you know? And then the main event, Jan Blachowicz versus Magomed Ankilaev. Uh, I've got Magomed here. I hope he makes it look easy for us and we don't get a Tiago Santos fight. Yeah. Uh, tickets on him at minus 250. Tickets on him at plus 1,000 on Saturday. I am I am pumped for this fight, Magomed, man. I, I as well think he holds all the clear pack to victory is whether it stays standing or it, it does go to the mat. So Magomed to become your new light heavyweight champion and dog him and Jerry is going to be an incredible fight. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you guys tuning in, hanging out with us for the podcast. 13 total fights, last pay-per-view of the year. Make sure to like the video, sub to the channel if you haven't. We'll see you guys back next week. Peace.